let me welcome you to this uh, evening's event on uh, sure. the Catholic intellectual tradition, uh, revitalizing this well. tradition on the contemporary uh, Catholic University campus. Uh, my name is Bob Newton. I'm uh, the interim director of the Church in the 21st Century Center that is sponsoring this event, and I'm also special assistant to the president of Boston College. Uh -huh. Before introducing the uh, moderator of tonight's event, I'd like to say a few words about the Church in the 21st Century Center. It was founded by Father Leahy, the president of Boston College, nine years ago in the middle of the clerical sexual abuse crisis uh, here in the archdiocese and, uh, and beyond. Uh, it was intended to be Boston College's response uh, to this crisis in the church. And its mission is to be a resource and a catalyst for the renewal of the church uh, in the United States. We have four focal issues. Unless I pull a Rick Perry and not remember them all, <laughs> I've written them down. Uh, handing on the faith, roles and relationships in the church, uh, relationships and sexuality in the Catholic tradition, and the Catholic intellectual tradition. Over the past nine years, the center has sponsored uh, over 400 events and brought about 50,000 people to the programs here on campus. Uh, we have a robust website, which I encourage you to consult. We, we've had hundreds of thousands of visitors uh, from over 100 different countries. We publish uh, a magazine twice a year called C21 Resources on an issue that's important to Catholics and uh, is dis it's distributed to over 160,000 people. So if you're not a, one might say a subscriber, it doesn't cost anything, uh, just make sure you get, you send us an email and we'll put you on the mailing list. Uh, we have also have a book series uh, which has to date uh, published uh, 10 volumes. Uh, tonight's, uh, I would like to especially point out that the C21 publication, which I think each of you received on the way in with the program, uh, entitled The Catholic Intellectual Tradition, A Conversation at Boston College. Tonight's um, conversation fits, obviously, into the center's mission to promote the renewal of the church, and in particular, to uh, promote the renewal of the Catholic intellectual tradition. To introduce this evening's uh, to moderate the conversation and introduce uh, tonight's very distinguished uh, speaker, I'd like to uh, introduce Father Robert Mbelli. Uh, Father Mbelli is a member of the theology department at Boston College and a priest of the Archdiocese of New York. He's also on the steering committee for the Church in the 21st Century Center and has over the years been one of our most vigorous, one of the most vigorous contributors uh, to our programs. So, Father Mbelli. Uh, my thanks to Dr. Newton and to the uh, C21 uh, committee for enabling me to fulfill a lifelong ambition, standing in for Charlie Rose. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure and privilege to welcome uh, here to Boston College, though he was here yesterday, uh, sponsored by the philosophy department, Professor Charles Taylor, uh, one of the most eminent philosophers of our time. And his great work, which many of you know and which uh, you can obtain at a 20% discount, uh, is A Secular Age, which has set the terms for the discussion of secularity in our own time. Uh, basically, the format this evening will be that I will engage uh, Professor Taylor for approximately 30 minutes asking some questions. Uh, and then we will open it to the floor for, again, approximately 25 to 30 minutes, so that it will be a real conversation amongst us. Uh, despite the book's enormous size, and again, you know it, uh, in many ways, uh, the book has the tone and style of a conversation, a conversation between Professor Taylor and his reader. And indeed, at times, he encourages the reader to, to stop to finish a chapter and stop before going on uh, to the next one. Uh, it's in that spirit that we gather for the conversation this afternoon. And if I could put it symbolically, in some ways, the conversation uh, is between 
a secular age and that little pamphlet that Dr. Newton referred to, uh, Boston College, the uh, Church in the 21st Century Initiatives, uh, attempt to speak of the Catholic intellectual tradition uh, as an ongoing conversation. And so this is part of the conversation that we are continuing. Uh, I'd venture to say, if I read the book correctly, uh, that what uh, Professor Taylor has done, he's provided the historical, the cultural context uh, in which discussion of religion, at least in the European, North American context, has to proceed. Uh, so that context is one that we all have to be aware of, uh, no matter what our response is. But in addition to that, I think especially uh, those who know the book in chapter 20 of the book, which is intriguingly entitled Conversions, uh, Dr. Taylor also raises the question of content. Right, what is it that we are bringing to this conversation as Catholic Christians? And so it is both context and content which will uh, shape the questions that I'd like to pose. So if I may begin then, uh, Professor Taylor, how do you understand the Catholic intellectual tradition? Uh, what, to your mind, are some of its distinctive features? Mm -hmm. Well, I would prefer to speak of that in the plural. That, of course, there's a mainline philosophical theological tradition that comes to the, I mean, Aquinas being the massive figure here, though differently interpreted, and already different interpretations of that are uh, introduced pluralism. But in the 20th century, which is the immediately preceding century we come out of, there were other avenues into Catholic thought. I think Maurice Blondet in France, for instance, or, uh, for example, the engagement of Catholic thinkers with uh, Wittgenstein, think of Elizabeth Anscombe, with uh, Heidegger, we have Father Richardson here, and, and uh, Fergus Carr might be mentioned, and of course Fergus also engaged, was engaged with Wittgenstein. With the phenomenological tradition, think of well, Edith Stein, of course, emerging out of her work with Husserl. And I think some of the most uh, interesting and fertile work has been done where you cross over these lines. I mean, I mean another figure that I think is very, very interesting from this point of view is Alistair McIntyre, who, in a certain sense, came later to the domestic tradition, to the to Aquinas, after a long itinerary in which he was engaged with a lot of you know, 20th century philosophy. And so these crossovers, or rather these, inter, these conversations between the different ways of conceiving Catholic philosophy, Catholic intellectual work, I think is really what, what should be further preserved, uh, fostered, because I think this is where very interesting work can be done. I mean, add something more here, which uh, looks as though it's going beyond the Catholic tradition, but I think the Catholic Church it is. There is an Orthodox Church, Russian particularly, I think of someone like Pavel Florensky, right? But the, the whole take on the idea that we Westerners are totally deviant because we've separated so clearly secular thought from religious thought, and they must be thought of rather <coughs> in a kind of symbiosis and connection together. Very influential, what well, he's influenced by Solovyov and influenced Bulgakov and others. And there's something very, very, I think, very important, very uh, fertile possibility in examining this as well. So, uh, you know, I would like to see, ideally, many of these voices connecting with each other, including, including that Orthodox tradition or tradition. Just to press that a little bit, uh, granted the need for a sort of plurality, the inexhaustibility of the mystery, uh, I wonder if there is a, what I sometimes call, a sort of base grammar, yeah. which identifies the different traditions as nonetheless pertaining to the tradition. Yeah. Uh, if I may quote you on 771, you, you speak of uh, Christianity as the faith of the incarnate God. Now, is that a sine qua non from which whatever traditions yeah. speak to, that's a basis from which they both have to, they all have to depart? Right? Yeah, that's right. And, and all the, the, the strands I'm mentioning have, have you know, started from there or have been very deeply embedded in that, including, of course, the Orthodox one. I think that's where we 
that is anyway part of the basic common ground. And, and would, you, would, would you be willing to speak of other things which are part of that basic common ground that you think are sort of indispensable to a distinctive Catholic tradition? Um, I mean, I suppose, what, what, is, uh, what is not contained in, that, in, the, in the Incarnation? Is what, you know, the whole, I mean, obviously the Trinity is part of the same, uh, let's take the Nicene Creed, I think we have, okay. we have there a pretty clear idea of what the basic common ground is. Um, and the point is, it's been very differently lived and conceived in different areas. And the reason why I brought in the Orthodox is that I have a sense that sometimes we need to be jolted out of very old habits of thought, which are not even confined to the Catholic Church, but sometimes, you know, in the West, confined to our argument with Protestantism or our argument with secularism. There are ways of thinking about this which we got into grooves around. Um, and the way it's already been done, I mean, the people who were part of the background of Vatican II did some of that. What's really interesting is people like Congal de Lubac, that they, instead of you know, hacking out the old issues about modernism and non-modern, anti-modern, et cetera, they went right back to the fathers, this idea of ressourcement, reaching your sources, and they, came up with new ways of looking at some of these issues that had been lost. So that's why I see the Catholic traditions as, as plural, as starting from different points, as retrieving some things that were elsewhere or way back that can give us a new, new insight. I mean, sometimes you just need to be shaken out of what are the obvious contexts, even to you, the obvious contexts, for thinking of these issues. Mm -hmm. uh, my reading of your uh, wrestling with secularity, as yeah. it appears in the West, is that you're neither an uncritical celebrant of it, uh, nor are you a, uh, a denigrator of it. And so there's a nuance in your discernment about it. Uh, I guess I'm interested, because this is part of our conversation, what do you think about, uh, what do you think in secularity uh, seems to be open to the Catholic vision? Mm -hmm. And what about it seems to have a deaf ear? Are you able to talk to that? Yeah, I mean, I think these two are sort of connected because, well, in part, some of the really great things we want to name in modern secular society, I mean, democracy, conception of human rights, which is really universally applied and isn't restricted in any way to people who, are, who believe this or that, the notions of equality, non-discrimination, this whole, package, I think it's one of the great achievements, realizations of human history. And it's, it bears a very complex relation to the Christian faith because it partly was inspired by certain elements, facets of the Christian faith, and partly was realized uh, sometimes against the, <laughs> the resistance of the Catholic Church and other churches, right? And so we we sort of, uh, we, there's a kind of collaboration between this Christian tradition on one hand and figures like Voltaire and others who heavily criticize us, and we, we sort of owe them, uh, I think, as I've said elsewhere, a vote of thanks for pushing us farther in a direction that we ought to have been going in. So there is a sense that, yeah, we're on the same wavelengths, we're really very much bound up with each other. On the other hand, on the other hand, there's a kind of narrowness to this, to this modern secular, or less secular formulations of these kind of achievements of rights of, of democracy, which I think can be partly summed up by their too great confidence in certain codes, rule books. I mean, just look at a lot of modern ethics, be they Kantian inspired or utilitarian inspired, the idea is the important thing is to get the criterion that can generate all the things you ought to do and the things you ought not to do. So it's ought and ought not. It's a series of, the notion of obligation is crucial there. You know, I think of how Elizabeth Anscombe upsets this, if some of you know her work, you know, in bringing back Aristotelian ethics. But this is the setting of a lot of modern thinking. And I think that that is very dangerous. We were having this conversation earlier, I apologize, <laughs> with another, another group. That kind of code 
I would say, fetishism or belief that getting the right code and you apply it, you know, the system, perfect system of liberalism, the perfect system of socialism, it leaves out something very important in human life and it can become restrictive, exclusionary, uh, distortive of human life. So you have to have from somewhere else a sensibility of when that is happening, when you know, it's, liberalism is being used to exclude, can be, right? It can be used to mobilize against a minority which is allegedly not on the right wavelength. Think of contemporary Islamophobia in our Western society as an example. Right? And there I think that um, one of the sources of this kind of thinking outside the box is central to the Christian faith. I mean, how to put it? Uh, in the New Testament you have the central figure is always reaching out to those who have been excluded on the margins by what looks like a very good code. I mean, he's not upsetting that code, it's the law, right? But, but is pointing out how there are moments when it becomes distortive, exclusionary, and rejecting. There's I mean, part of what's really tremendously intellectually exciting about reading the New Testament again and again and again is you see Christ is constantly redefining the issue, right? what, it, what people thought it was. And <clears throat> in that kind of sensibility is nourished by, I think, ought to be nourished by the Christian faith. So it's not the only source of that, but it is a source of that. And that's, that's the against the grain part of it. Right? We have to step in from time to time against the grain if I heard you rightly, this codification mentality leaves out, I think you said, something essential to human life. Yeah. What is that something essential that it does not cover? Yeah. Well, no, I wouldn't put it only that. I think there's an interesting question the way you're putting it. I'll come to that. Yeah, I won't, let me come to that in a minute. But I was thinking of not that there's some one thing, right? But the, the quantification is not that there's some one thing it leaves out, though I think there is, but, but that those kind of, if you trust codes like that, instantly against the advice of Aristotle <laughs> and therefore Aquinas as well as a lot of other wise people, you get into a situation where applying the code as you see it, you know, absolutely, literally, has these terrible consequences. But certainly there is in another way <clears throat> a, some big thing left out, which is a sense of relation to something much, much bigger than human beings, and not, not only, of course, in the Christian form, in relation to God or in relation to Christ, but in relation, you know, it could be, a Buddhist could be formulating this in relation to nirvana and so on. There's something that tends to be left out of the conversation, right? And the idea is, well, we're not denying that because we're letting it happen, but <clears throat> sometimes not being open to thinking in those terms can be, you know, what, leads you to apply the code in a destructive way. Many years ago when I was a seminarian and we had a uh, prominent speaker come in, uh, the first question from the floor was always, well, what can we as seminarians do about whatever the <laughs> issue was that was being discussed? So I'm going to get to that question now. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, you say uh, in your book, uh, you speak of a massive unlearning with respect to the great languages of transcendence. Yeah. And that struck me. How, in face of that, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think the contemporary Catholic college or university uh, might be able to do in terms of revitalizing mm -hmm. the Catholic intellectual tradition? So yeah. really do you have some thoughts on that? I mean, I don't have any tremendously structured thoughts on that, but obviously starting off from the set of different traditions that I'd like to see in conversation, I could imagine that it would connect with people who, many, many young people who haven't read the Bible, either Old Testament or New Testament, have only the vaguest idea of it, have no real first-hand acquaintance with various kinds of Catholic spirituality, I mean, be they Jesuit or, or those of the Dominicans or those of, you know, St. Teresa and so on, have very little connection with the liturgy and the language of the, of the liturgy. Right? So these words or manners of praying or whatever don't, just don't strike them. They just seem to be 
dead and, and uh, alien and strange, right? So the possibility of what a Catholic college could do could be to have these there and as uh, modes of thinking, modes of speaking, which could awaken something and then put them back in contact. I mean, that's the whole issue in the modern contemporary Western world. How do you reconnect? You know, I've, often, I've often said that there's this, this extraordinary situation of you look around you and there are people that are really spiritual uh, seekers. That's a very, very big phenomenon in our world, right? And some of them say we're spiritual and not religious, but they're looking for something, right? And then now talking about not necessarily the intellectual tradition, but the Catholic, if you like, tradition of the spiritualities of the, you know, of Saint Teresa, of Saint Francois de Sade, of you know, you can, we all are connected in different ways. I was, you know, in Quebec we were connected through the French 17th century, so you know, Marie de l'Incarnation, Saint Francois de Sade. That's what is very uh, should be available for us, you see, but it isn't because there was this great break in 1960 when well, people left the church. So you have this great hunger for various possible lines of spiritual growth and development. On one hand, on the other hand, you have this immense, in a sense, treasury, if you look back to the whole history in the Catholic tradition, and the two are not connecting. Now, I wish I had, you know, what are the seminarians, <laughs> what should seminarians do, or what should we all do? I wish I had a quick fix, I mean, a, you know, a three-stage process to propose which would bring this about, and I don't. I just think that that is our biggest task, in a certain sense, reconnecting. Yeah, I think that's great encouragement, because I think some of that is happening at Boston College, uh, but I think we'd like to promote it in different creative ways. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned before that I think that you are both a, a proponent of positive things that secularity, modernity has uh, produced, but also are uh, not uncognizant of its weaknesses. And one that strikes me in particular is you speak in a few places in the book. Uh, you say, for example, uh, you speak of the greater transformation which Christian faith holds out. So that uh, though even secularity may speak of transformations, that there is a greater transformation which Christian faith holds out. And then, I think provocatively, you say, uh, beyond what is normally understood as human flourishing. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could elaborate a, a little bit more on that. Uh, just one last point. Uh, it's intriguing that in the index of the book, and obviously reflecting the book, uh, several times there's a reference to theosis. So the, uh, the Eastern Orthodox tradition of divinization. Mm -hmm. uh, which one would not expect to find in a book entitled uh, A Secular Age. So I wonder if you'd speak to that. Yeah. Well, there is a, a, our modern secular world, this world in which democracy and rights are central, is very much concerned with transformation, with even, I mean, I think too naively seeing us marching forward stage by stage and introducing democracy and human rights here and there and elsewhere, and finally a world in which it's safe for democracy, was the expression one of your presidents used <laughs> earlier in the 20th century. That kind of, uh, of picture. So it's really very much concerned with changing people. But there are certain limits that that is seen as being the, the un, un, as it were, transcendable limits of human life. Whereas, if you are struck by the Catholic tradition in ways that I have been. If you look, I mean, let's take examples. You look at a figure like St. Francis. It was beyond all reason, beyond what you think is really possible, that kind of love, right? It's something that seems to be just, you know, totally beyond. In fact, we're, we're tempted to think this is some kind of neurotic <laughs> excess or something of that kind. So much as it jump the boundaries of of, of what we understand as normally available to human beings at their best, right? So we have on one side, and there may be something to be said for both sides of this difference. We have on one side a set of goals of what a decent human life is and being a virtuous and good person is, you know, the good Democrat, the good citizen, and so on. Concerned about the public good, concerned about, and that's something that looks reachable. I'm not sure it is. 
right? But it looks easily, I mean, not impossible, not beyond human power. And on the other hand, we have these models of, of in this case, love, of agape, which, which do seem to be something, you know, I mean, almost superhuman in a certain sense. So there's a big issue in anyone's spiritual life, in a sense, which is there on the, on the side of, the, of it, as it were, in the margins. Which of these do you really believe in and have faith in? It's a question of faith. I mean, so I may say, yes, I have faith that human beings can realize the ideal of the good citizen, etc. But I, <laughs> beyond that, no, don't ask me to <clears throat> believe in anything beyond that. Or I can say, no, I mean, against a certain amount of evidence, I have faith that it can go farther than that. And there's something absolutely arresting and magnificent about that, something that could uh, do in some way infinitely greater good to human beings that surround the person of that kind than the lesser ambition. Okay, to be said on the, on the uh, counsel for the prosecution of this thing, that, oh yeah, you know, you people have all these very, very high ideals and what happens when you have that kind of high ideal and you want to push it through is you end up putting people in concentration camps or sending in the Inquisition and so on. So it's much better to have somewhat lower ambitions which can actually get realized. And there's a case there, and I don't ultimately accept it, it would take us too long to <laughs> argue this out. I don't ultimately accept it, but there's a lot of truth in that, that we very often carry our more transcendent faith in directions that are tremendously destructive, anti-human, misanthropic, you know, there's lots of that in history. So I can see why there's a case against this. But this is a big, if you like, existential choice that people have in our world. Two very different kinds of faith. They're all, all, both are kinds of faith, you know, because you have to have a lot of faith in humanity just to think that everybody can realize the <laughs> relatively high ideals that are part of our secular world. This may follow from that in a more personal vein. Yeah. Uh, and maybe I did not understand fully uh, the, your expression, but you spoke of yourself in one point that I found, uh, in one place that I found, as a believer again. Yeah. Yes, what do I mean by that? Well, it's really, you know, I was very influenced, I think I said earlier, by Conga when I was very young, and actually before Vatican II, uh, Yves Conga, with his great idea, which I think was finally inspiring a lot of the writing of Vatican II, that the church has constantly to renew itself in the face of a new generation, a new, a new as it, world, new concerns, and really speak to, to these, right? So that it can't simply, it's the idea that it mustn't change at all, that it has to keep the message absolutely in the terms that it was before, is very destructive in the end, a denial of its its vocation. So then I, this very interesting book I read, in this case by a Protestant by evangelical, was called Believing Again, a line he got from, from Auden. Right? And these, these two connect in my mind. I mean, there are certain people that are believing still, in the sense that they are, oh, we're carrying on the faith as it was given to us by our fathers exactly in that way. And there are certain other people who have in a way, been unhooked from that, even alienated from that, even past periods of you know, rejection of that, but it doesn't need to go that far. And they come back in, an, in this new d direction, this new itinerary, I like this expression, itineraries, I use it a lot in the book, right? They come back by a new itinerary through the 20th century, through the age of, that uh, Congar identifies as the subjective, the age of subjectivity, through that, they come back to the faith. So they reconnect with it. And that's what I mean by believing again. So you see, the ultimate model behind all that is not the idea of this unchanging faith I mean, through history. I mean, there are some things that are unchanging. We were talking about the, you know, the incarnation and so on. But where we have, just as we do in a, at the same moment in different parts of the world, have very different ways of living the Catholic faith. Kerala or in, or in um, 
Latin America or in Europe or here. So across history, we have very, very different ways of living. And it's very important to hang on to this, not just because we have to read the signs of the times and live our own way, but because, frankly, I think we can and should be inspired by these other ways. I mean, there, there we get back to the theologians of Vatican II who go back through the fathers. Right? We're all in this church together, and we can get immense inspiration from these other ages in their difference. But that's not only compatible with, but requires that we be relevant to our own age. And that's the great thing that my sort of heroes, Con Gal, did you back, that's what they did. They went back to find a way of being more present in, that, in the 20th century, and the same goes for the 21st century. I may have asked this question before, but I'd like to reframe it a little bit, because yeah. uh, as a theologian, uh, I have no problem with grand narratives. Yeah. And I was delighted to read that you have no problem with grand <laughs> narratives. So <laughs> that, that, business, that was so. encouraging to me. Uh, I'd like to end my portion before we open it to uh, questions, conversation with the audience, by asking, what about the grand narrative of Catholicism particularly recommends itself to you? As I say, I may have asked this in another way, but I'd like to frame it that way. Yeah. The grand narrative of Catholicism, what, what, what do you find compelling about it? Well, my sense of the grand narrative is what I was just talking about, that there, there is this really potential indefinite, I mean, you could say infinity, but I mean an indefinite number of ways of being a Christian and therefore acceding to a kind of communion, because the Christian faith is only defined by aiming at this kind of communion, from very different starting points and being able to meet across that. And so I think that the narrative is not exactly totally, I mean, yes, the narrative has to be rewritten at every, every moment, but the form of it is the way in which at different moments, the fashion and understanding of being Christian has passed the, the, the flame on, if you like, to another, which is different, but can be connected up and ought to be connected up to a different, which, et cetera. That is the, the narrative where there isn't, unlike the narratives of progress, there's not an end point in <laughs> where the last version is the right one, right? No, there, but there is, as I see the communion of saints and I see uh, the parousia, there's a kind of gathering of time. So in, it's a very strange narrative for a lot of moderns who have, we've all bought into some degree the narrative of progress and so on. And so it's a, it's a very different narrative, but it is a kind of narrative. Thank you.